All right, let's pick back up with anatomy and physiology of vision. So vision is the perception of light reflected by various objects. Uh, the eyes and visual pathways in the central nervous system can determine an object's size, shape, and color. Uh, we can detect objects at a distance. Uh, we can detect the rate they are moving and the direction of movement can also be interpreted uh, by the, the neurons of the central nervous system. Uh, some energy exits um, as electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the range of those wavelengths are measured in nanometers. Uh, this is the principles of light. Uh, gamma rays and X-rays have short wavelengths. Microwaves and radio waves have longer wavelengths. Uh, the visible light spectrum uh, is the range of wavelengths that the human eye can detect uh, as a range of particular colors. Think of the colors of the rainbow. Uh, shorter wavelengths of visible light are blue and violet. The longer wavelengths are red. Uh, the basic unit of light is referred to as a photon, uh, and the photon is what stimulates photoreceptors in the retina. Uh, when you took biology, hopefully you uh, did a little bit on um, photosynthesis, and the photon is the, the particle of light that photosynthesis works with. Uh, here is the principles of light. Again, this, these are all the wavelengths of light. Uh, we know if you get an overabundance of gamma rays, you turn into the Incredible Hulk. Uh, if you get an overabundance of microwaves, you get cooked from the inside out. Uh, this is the visible spectrum right here. Uh, ultraviolet light rays, these are UV lights in you know the ceiling above our head. Infrared, uh, if you have one of those infrared cameras where you can see heat signatures. You know, if you go out looking for Bigfoot, you look for an infrared uh, signature. That's those ray waves there. Here's visible light. Goes from 350 nanometer wavelength to 750. I will never ask you to remember those numbers. I do, however, expect you to remember that the blues and the purples have short wavelengths and the reds and the oranges have long wavelengths. Uh, light rays can be bent or refracted when they pass through some translucent object. Uh, the refractive index of an object measures the amount of refraction it exerts on light rays. Air, for instance, has a refractive index of 1, uh, meaning that light passing through air is not significantly bent. Water has a higher refractive index than air, and water can very significantly refract, refract light. Uh, this is a uh, demonstration teachers used to do a long time ago is they would take a large beaker of water and stick a pencil in it and when you look at it from the side the pencil looks broken because the light is being refracted but if you just stand a pencil up on your teacher's desk the, the pencil looks straight and it does not look bent another place you can see this is uh, looking at fish in an aquarium when you see the fish swimming around in the aquarium. The fish looks like it's right here, but in fact, the fish is over here somewhere because of the refraction of light. Refraction of light also depends on the angle that the light strikes the surface. The greater the angle, the greater the refraction. Curved surfaces tend to bend light more at their edges. Uh, that's why, depending on what type of glasses you wear, whether you are far-sighted or near-sighted, your lens will have a different curvature. Uh, convex lenses, convex means that the surface bulges outward in the middle, causes light rays to bend inward or converge as they pass through. Concave lenses are thicker at the edges and depressed in the middle, which causes light rays to diverge uh, or spread out. Uh, if you ever look at people's eyeglasses, uh, everybody's eyeglasses, the lens is going to be shaped like this. this. This lens is going to have a curve outward. But if you measure the thickness of the lens from the outside to inside, that's where you see the difference. If the middle is thicker than the edge, that is a convex lens. If the edge is thicker than the middle, that is a concave lens. And when the rays of light converge on a single point, 
that is said to be in focus. That is the that is the concept behind eyeglasses, is to converge the light on a specific spot in the back of your eye. So do you need the lights to the light to diverge slightly, or do you need it to converge slightly? And again, here is a light, and you can't see it very well, but there is a bulging lens right there. And you can see that the light passes through and it all converges to a single point. And here, you, again, you can't see it very well, but there's a sort of curved lens there showing the light spreading out slightly. Uh, clear vision requires that light rays be focused on the retina, not in front or behind it. Uh, and that is the function of the lens in the cornea. Two thirds of the eye's refractive power occurs as light passes through the cornea. And the cornea has a refractive index similar to water. Uh, the lens then provides the fine tuning or the refractive adjustment that is required. And if your lenses aren't shaped correctly, then you have glasses that have lenses that shape things correctly. Uh, the amyotropic state occurs when the eye is relaxed and focused on different uh, on distant objects. Uh, the lens is in its normal flattened shape. Uh, parallel light rays are minimally refracted by the cornea and focused on the retina. Light rays from objects closer to the eye are more scattered. Therefore, there's more refraction, uh, greater than the cornea can provide, and the lens becomes more thickened is called accommodation. Uh, that refracts light more than flattened lenses, so more light uh, rays are focused on the retina. Again, here is, uh, we're looking at distances of more than 20 feet. The light rays start to diverge sharply at distances greater than 20 feet, uh, less than 20 feet. Uh, the light rays are almost parallel. So if you're looking at this distant vision, here's the apple tree way away the light starts to diverge and then your eye the cornea and the lens bring those back into shape whereas if you're holding an apple just a few feet from your eye you have less requirement um, the ciliary body surrounds the lens and relaxes when viewing distance distant objects uh, pulls the sphincter like muscles away from the lens creating tension on the suspensory ligament. Uh, this flattens the lens and reduces its refractive capability. Uh, the ciliary body then contracts when viewing nearby objects, which allows for accommodation. The ciliary body moves closer to the lens and the suspensory ligaments slacken, which allows the lens to change to a more thickened shape, uh, which gives us increased refractive power. Uh, pupillary constriction limits the amount of scattered light that makes objects appear blurry, uh, enters the edge of the lens, or objects appear to be more focused. Convergence is a process by which the eyeball moves more medially to direct light rays onto photoreceptor-dense regions of the phobia. Uh, when we have errors in refraction, uh, there is limited accommodation for this due to an aging lens or the shape of the eyeball. Uh, near point accommodation, the closest point at which the eye can focus on an object, increases with age as the lens becomes less flexible. Uh, Crisbyopia is an individual's near point of accommodation is when an individual's near point of accommodation is 10, 10 to 20 inches or greater, uh, usually occurs in an individual in their fifth decade, so when they're in their 50s, uh, late 40s also. Uh, you have difficulty reading, uh, can be corrected with reading glasses or bifocals. Uh, bifocals uh, are glasses that have two different prescriptions in them, uh, one for near vision, one for distant vision. Uh, Accommodation by the lens can also depend on having correct eye shape and proper curvature of the cornea. Uh, emetropia is the desired situation 
The length of the eyeball is ideal in anterior to posterior direction and allows for light coming through the lens to focus directly on the retina. Uh, hyperopia or farsightedness, the eyeball is too short or the cornea is too flat. Uh, in this case, the lens is unable to accommodate. In other words, it can't get thick enough to focus the light on the retina. Uh, instead, focuses behind the retina, causing blurry vision when looking at close objects. Again, um, one of the mis uh, misunderstandings is uh, farsightedness means you can see things far away. You don't see things close. Uh, convex lens, correct, hyperopia or hyperopia uh, by causing more light to converge on the retina. So there is the focal point way back here. You want the focal point here. So you put a corrective lens here put a corrective lens here, converging things, then the lens can then compensate and get everything here. Myopia or nearsightedness is the distance between the cornea and the lens is too great or the cornea is too curved. Uh, the lens is unable to flatten enough and become an incoming light is focused in front of the retina. Uh, for this correction, you have concave lenses correct myopia by diverging the incoming light before it contacts the lens, redirects uh, focus into the retina. So people who are nearsighted can see things close up. They have trouble with their distance vision. So here again, you have no, without any aid of glasses, you get a focal point right here. You put the lens here, a concave lens here starts to bring those lines together, and then you get a more focal point. In other words, here, the eyeball is too long. So in nearsightedness, the eyeball is too long. In farsightedness, the eyeball is too short. Uh, astigmatism is the curvature of the lens or corneal is irregular. Uh, light rays are not evenly refracted. Uh, results in blurred vision at all distances uh, can be treated with corrective lenses that adjust for specific abnormal, abnormal corneal and lens curvatures. Uh, if astigmatism involves only the corneal surface, it can be treated with a uh, surgical procedure known as LASIK, which stands for Laser Assisted In Situ Keratomaliosis. Uh, the laser is used to remodel the cornea and smooth out irregularities. The problem with people wanting who have uh, severe astigmatism uh, and LASIK procedures, uh, the astigmatism can be involving other structures. And if it involves other structures, then LASIK surgery, while it may help, will not cure the condition. If astigmatism is due to deeper problems, such as an abnormal lens curvatures, Special forms of LASIK may be used, uh, but that induces asymmetry into the corneal surface, which compensates for deeper irregularities. Uh, ASIC is also, LASIK is also a popular procedure for correction of myopia and hyperopia. Uh, the laser reshapes the cornea to adjust for the amount of refraction, so light may be focused on the focal point in, retina, in the retina. So when people have, for their myopia or hyperopia, uh, have LASIK surgery, what they are basically doing is, and I'm going to air quote, they're turning their corneas into a pair of glasses. They're simply reshaping the cornea to, the, to accommodate for the shape of the eyeball. Uh, there are two types of photoreceptors found within the inner layer of the retina, the rods and the cones. Uh, they are adjacent to the outer pigmented epithelial layer of the retina. Uh, the cones function best in high light, producing a very high resolution color vision. The rods do not detect color. They are most sensitive in low light situations and as a component for our peripheral vision. Uh, photoreceptor synapse with bipolar cells. Uh, neurons that communicate with retinal ganglion cells, and these retinal ganglion cells uh, in the anterior most region of the retina 
uh, axons for, or their axons form the optic nerve or cranial nerve number two. Horizontal cells and amacrine cells uh, are involved in image processing as well. So here are your rods and your cones. The light comes in. You have cones here, you have rods here. So the sort of pinky colored ones are cones and the more orangey colored ones are rods. Uh, rods uh, are cylindrical. They have outer segments that contain about a thousand uh, or thousands of flattened discs containing pigment uh, rhodorhodopsin. This absorbs light. All the rods contain this pigment. Uh, they do not distinguish between different wavelengths of light. Uh, rhodopsin is composed of a protein called opsin uh, and the pigment uh, retinol. Retinol is derived from vitamin A. In the dark, retinol is in a bent configuration uh, called cis retinol. And again, here is the blow up of the structure of a rod and cone showing the opsin, the cis retinol here, and the rhodopsin molecule there. There's the pigmented layer of the retina and the rods and the cones. Cones, the outer segment contains a pigment called iodopsin. Uh, it's composed of retinol and the protein photopsin. Uh, photopsin is similar to opsin but has a slightly altered structure, which allows it to absorb different wavelengths of light. Uh, three forms of photopsin allow response to wavelengths perceived as blue, green, or red. Again, uh, here in a little while, we're going to talk about red-green color blindness, and that is uh, disruptions in the photopsin that people who have red-green color blindness. And again, here is Micrograph of rods and cones from the human retina. Again, the sort of pinky ones are cones. The sort of, again, orange or whatever color that is are the rods. Again, here showing the blues and the greens of the rods and cones and the reds. The wavelengths of light. Again, I will never ask you to remember which wavelength of light uh, is absorbed by which rod or cone. Transduction of light into electrical signals begins when the photon encounters a disk in the outer segment of the rod or cone. Uh, in the absence of some stimulation, in the dark, for instance, photoreceptor cells are depolarized. Uh, they continuous, continuously release neurotransmitters into the synapses with other neurons, and that reverses, or, or this is the reverse of most neuron activation. Most of the time, it takes a stimulus to release neurotransmitters, but these neurotransmitters are continuously being released. In the presence of light, photoreceptor becomes hyperpolarized and stops releasing the neurotransmitter, which alerts the activities of the neighboring retina cells to send information to the brain. In the dark, opsin and cisretinol combine to form rhodopsin, in the disc membrane of the rod, uh, a G protein complex transducin and uh, phosphodesiderase enzyme, or PDE, are inactive. Sodium ion channels in the plasma membrane of the outer segment are open by second messenger cyclic um, guanosine monophosphate, which is bound. And this is again an example of the gradient score principle. Uh, the sodium ions will flow down the concentration gradient into the cell and depolarize the cell. And again, here is that what's going on in the dark. The rhodopsin and cis retinol combine, transduction, the PDE, causing this chamber to open and allow the membranes, to, the, excuse me, ions to cross the membrane. When light strikes a photoreceptor, Light converts the retinol into transretinol, separates from opsin, and activates the transducin, activate or activated transducin, activates the PDE, 
Those sodium channels will then close. The photoreceptor will hyperpolarize. And PDE converts CGMP to simply GMP. The less amounts of CGMP reduces the number of open sodium channels, and the influx of sodium is reduced. So this is what's happening during life. See, the opsin has separated. The trans retinol has moved away, locking up the PDE, which prevents this from being formed, which now closes the sodium channel. Uh, rhodopsin is bleached when trans retinol disassociates from opsin, can no longer respond to light. Uh, trans, -retinol, trans retinol must travel to the pigmented epithelial cells of the retinous outer layer, where the cis retinol is reformed at the expense of ATP. So again, we're using up ATP. It's reform the reformed cis retinol is then transported back to the photoreceptor. Uh, Adaptations for dark and light allow for adjustments in the amount of light present in the environment, uh, partially depending on pupil size. Uh, when light is suddenly reduced, tones can no longer function. So that's why when you turn the lights off, for the first few moments the lights are off, you are completely blind. You can't see anything. Uh, rods are slow to regenerate enough rhodopsin to function. It can take up to 40 minutes for rods to completely become functional again. Uh, where the retina is extremely sensitive. Again, if you go into a coal mine and your headlamp goes out, you are completely blind for an extended period of time before your eyes will begin to adjust slightly uh, to that decreased light level. Uh, light, when light is suddenly increased, bleaches the rods and cones, resulting in a blinding glare. Rods become non-functional. The rhodopsin is bleached as fast as it can be regenerated. Cones can regenerate functional pigments much faster, uh, so they are able to respond within a few minutes as their sensitivity decreases. You go from uh, a darkened movie theater and then you step outside into a very bright, sunshiny afternoon. You get the ter terrible glare, uh, and for several seconds, you can't hardly see anything before your eyes begin to adjust to the light. Uh, photoreceptors depolarize, which releases glutamate on bipolar cells. This is how an image is processed in the dark. The glutamate inhibits the bipolar cell, which reduces the release of neurotransmitters. The retinal ganglion cell does not produce an active potential. No signals are sent to the brain via the optic nerve. Uh, however, in light, Light hyperpolar, hyperpolarizes the photoreceptor, which stops releasing glutamate. The bipolar cell is freed from inhibition and depolarizes, which releases neurotransmitters onto the retinal ganglion cells. And then those retinal ganglion cells produce action potentials, which then send the message to the brain via the optic nerve. And again, what goes on in the dark, photoreceptor repolarizes. Uh, releases glutamate into the bipolar cells. Glutamate inhibits the cell, reduces the release of neurotransmitters. Retinal ganglion does not produce an action potential. No signal goes forward. In light, however, hyperpolarizes the photoreceptors, stops releasing glutamate. No glutamate, then the neurotransmitters get released. Neurotransmitters, we send the signal uh, to where we figure out what we're looking at. Colorblindness. People who lack the functional gene for one or more cone pigments, uh, the most common form involves missing or defective genes for red or green pigment. <clears throat> Affected people have difficulty distinguishing red from green. Excuse me, both colors appear as a grayish brown. Why is it universally accepted that when traffic lights are hung, the green is going to be in one place and the red is going to be in the other. So people with red, green color blindness, they don't learn that that one's the red one and that one's the green one. They simply learn when the one on top is lit, is lit you stop. When the one on the bottom is lit, you go. Uh, about 8 to 10 males have some form of color blindness, or 8 to 10% of males. 
uh, compared to fewer than 1% of females. Uh, that's because the more common types of color blindness are carried on the X chromosome. And as you remember from your biology class, I hope, uh, things that are carried on the X chromosome are called sex linked traits. And sex linked traits are much more common in men than they are in women because males only have one X chromosome. Therefore, they only have to have one copy of the bad gene to suffer from this condition, whereas females have two X chromosomes, so they have to have two copies of the bad gene to be colorblind. Uh, blue pigment is not on the X chromosome. The mutation is much less common in both sexes. Uh, it's possible to last all three pigments, but this is extremely rare, so back up one. Red-green color blindness, much more common in males than in females. Blue color blindness, equally uh, common in both sexes. And it is possible to be red, green, blue color blind, but that again is extremely rare. Uh, no cure for color blindness, no treatment for it. People learn to compensate uh, using clues such as color intensity or location. For instance, red light is at the top, excuse me, green light is at the bottom, and that's universal. Go anywhere in the world, red light's on top, green light's on bottom. Uh, <clears throat> most common test. For red-green color blindness, Ishihara plates, uh, collections of dots within numbers embedded uh, in the plate below that you see here, uh, a person with red-green color blindness will see the number 21, whereas someone with normal vision will see the number 74. Uh, and here's the thing, reliable color blindness tests require looking at original plates. Believe it or not, this little book of Ishihara plates, it is a book which is about probably 15 pages of Ishihara plates. This thing will cost you to get an original version several hundred dollars. You can buy on the internet a $15 version. Those are not reliable. They have been remanufactured and reproduced and they are not as reliable. I'm going to stop with color blindness and we'll pick up with some other things about the eye and vision after a while.